great to see you all here with us this morning in Pilgrim Old Baptist Church. I can kind of just say you're very welcome. And if you're tuning in online, you're also uh, very welcome to join with us. Um, we're just going to begin by reading Psalm 100 together. Feel free to turn to it with me. Psalm 100. And we'll read these few verses together. And we come to worship the Lord. Psalm 100, beginning the reading at verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord of all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. We do indeed serve a, a good God, and we are coming this morning to worship him, we are coming to make the joyful noise to the Lord. And let's do that as we begin by singing our only hymn together, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Let's stand as we sing together.
as he who made us and we are his, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God, we do know that you are indeed a good God, that your steadfast love endures forever, and that you are a faithful God. And Father, you are God who we can bring our petitions and our requests before. You are a God who is the God of all comfort. And Lord, this week we have been reminded of how you are the God of all comfort as we see tragedy around us. Lord, we pray and we remember the family of those killed, Lord, in the road this week. As those funerals will take place today and tomorrow, Lord, we pray for the families. We pray for the community in Strabana. Lord, that you will bring peace there. Lord, that you will bring comfort. Lord, we pray as well for the tragedy in the town this week. For the families there. Again, Lord, that you would bring comfort and peace to that family. And Lord, for those within our own congregation who have been buried this week, we think especially the Reverend family. Lord, we pray um, for them, that you would be near to them upon the death of Grace's uncle. But Father, we thank you that we can bring these requests to you. We thank you that you are a God who cares. Who loves each and every one of us and sent his son to die on the cross for us. And so, Father, as we come to you this morning to worship you, we pray that our praise and our worship will be acceptable in your sight. Lord, that your name will be uplifted and glorified in this place. And that we will see you at work in your word, as you speak through your word. Lord, we pray that you speak through your servant Alan this morning as he shares your word with us. Help each one of us to apply it to our lives through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just pray that everything that is said and done this morning would bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus Christ. And whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this point, I'm going to invite George to come and bring the announcements, and then Alan will come and lead the children. So. Well, I'd like to thank you all um, for sharing us today, those who joined us in the church building, and those who are joining us online, and you are all formally welcome. If you're here as a visitor, especially with welcome, you're the first to feel at home with us here and feel the month of Christian fellowship as we worship uh, together here this morning. The next one's well, the coming week, uh, as follows, at the end of the first part of our service, we will be around the Lord's table and can encourage you please to stay and remember your Lord in his own appointed way. Then this evening service at 6, we'll have a special visitors tonight, William and Lily uh, Sears, who will be along to sing to us and speak as well, I'm sure. So we can encourage you to come out, please, this evening. I know it is a bank holiday weekend, but please plan to be with us this evening. At uh, six o'clock Wednesday, uh, eight or prayer meeting and Bible study as normal. And then next week, there will be our association, the Baptist Association meetings, and there are various meetings planned uh, throughout the week. Baptist Missions Rally will be held in Lama Hinch. Now we're planning to show that online here in the church, so but that will be Tuesday, Tuesday night. Uh, it's just on Wednesday, but we'll miss that again next week. Then we mentioned that the car park, we have a wee bit of a problem, a good problem, in the top car park, and that is getting a wee bit overcrowded up in that car park. So uh, if you could, please, if you're coming at the last minute, there's room in the bottom of two car parks, but please do not reverse it on the main street. Uh, if you're stuck, make sure there's somebody there to direct you, and make sure there's no car coming the street at speed. So please just keep that in mind. As you come in this morning, you should have been given one of these coronation tracts that have been prepared by Roger Casual. We've got a number of copies we're going to distribute them through the village in the next few days. If you need any more, please lift them on the way out. If you've got friends or family that would like to give one of these to uh, seeing this as coronation week, uh, I'm sure that people would like to get them. It's very good 
gospel message and we'll try to swear up. So please take as many as you want as you leave this morning. Then we can ask to mention that the work prayer battery and the prayer union meeting will be held tomorrow morning, uh, Monday the 1st of May, commencing at 10 30 a.m. and that's on Louis on, on Main Street. And then on the express or some of the previous Hutchison on the death of her uncle. I'm sure her and the family start with her prayers in these days. Thank you. Thank you, George. Well, it is good to see you all here this morning. I know it, I know it is uh, bank holiday weekend and quite a number of ways. I was just thinking there before I stood up, Every time we get up here now, it seems to be, when we go to speak to the kids, we're talking about school holidays. There was never as many school holidays whenever I was at school. Um, you're off tomorrow, you're off next Monday, and then some will be off during May for the election. Um, and then there's another bank holiday towards the end of the month. And uh, I, I was talking to a teacher during the week, says, I don't have a full week of work all of May. And I thought, my goodness, wouldn't that just be great? But uh, it's the way things have fallen this year, so it is. And I'm sure you're all enjoying it. And I know many of the kids seem to be away as well uh, on this bank holiday weekend. But good to have you here. And we're going to sing uh, the song, uh, He Knows My Name. And uh, I don't think there's really any action there might be. But if you know them, you do them. And, uh, but the main thing is we all stand and sing this. And then following this, I'm going to pray then for the boys and girls. And uh, the Lord will bless them then as they go out uh, to Sunday school uh, this morning. So we'll all stand to sing, He Knows My Name. Thank you. Everyone stand then. Seem to go through the list of names 
um, before. Uh, so uh, if they wanted to say Alan, they maybe went, Paul Rock, Alan. Um, Heather used to always tell me she was always called Car Heather uh, because her sister's Carol and her mum would have wanted to speak to Heather but she always called her well, to Carol first of all and then Heather. Now the only thing is whenever that happened maybe we were in trouble. So we were. Um, but isn't it lovely that the Lord, he knows our name. He doesn't call us somebody else's name. He knows our name. He knows our thoughts. That's what we've been singing about this morning. And the other thing we've been reminded this morning is that when we can call on him. And that's the great privilege that is ours. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to pray the Lord to bless you as children, as you go to Sunday school, but as you grow up in this world, that the Lord will keep his hand upon you. And you know as well, boys and girls, we want you to know that whenever you're at home, you can pray to him as well. Prayer is not limited to just in a building, in a church building. You can call to him even on your own. You don't even need mum or dad. It's good to be able to pray with them as well. But even at home, maybe there's something worries you, something that troubles you, that he will hear your prayer as well. And we pray most of all, that first of all you pray that the Lord would save you. And indeed that he has forgiven you of your sins. So we're all going to pray. We'll do the prayer drill after three. The P-R-A-Y and we'll commit a walk to the Lord. Okay, one, two, three. P-R-A-Y. Father, we thank you for the new day you've given to us. And we thank you for the privilege that is ours to be able to meet here together this morning. And we thank you for the boys and girls. And we thank you, Lord, for those that you've given unto us as a church. And uh, Father, we think even um, of the blessing that uh, Jeffrey and Anne have received and a new granddaughter born just last night. But Lord, we think of all the boys and girls. We commend them to you and pray, Father, that you will bless them as they go to Sunday school this morning. Help them, Lord, to uh, enjoy Sunday school, to be blessed through the lessons that they indeed, Lord, have the hunger in their hearts, our God, for learning your word. We pray, Father, that each of them and they will have called upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. If they haven't already done so, we pray that they'll even do it in Sunday school this morning. We pray that you'll bless the teachers as they share your word, that you'll give help to them, and that you'll use them, our Father, uh, in this great responsibility that they have here today. We commend them all to you. Bless the boys and girls in their lives. Bless them in their home lives. Bless them in their school lives. We pray, Father, that you'll look after them in school throughout this week. Be with them, help them to enjoy the day off tomorrow, whether it be in the bank holiday. And Lord, we pray that you'll help them in their school work as well. And that throughout this week, Lord God, that their lives, uh, and Lord, especially those who receive, Lord, with, uh, 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 Lord, that their lives will be lived faithfully unto you. Be a shining light in the school that you have placed. And we commend them all to you now, and we ask it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George, as well. Um, just before the boys and girls do go out to Sunday school and Alan brings uh, God's word to us, we're going to stand uh, to sing our offering hymn um, after the offering has been collected. Speak, O oh Lord, as we'll remain seated for the first part of this hymn.
2 Timothy chapter 3 once again. Apologies, we don't have the, the outline on the screen, but uh, the internet was giving us a lot of problems this morning, but I wanted to download it uh, onto our, our own computer, and uh, we weren't able to get that done, but uh, uh, hopefully you'll still be able to follow along. We're coming back, say, to the series that we've been on, say, for a long time, and uh, uh, we'll uh, continue on for a while, although we are coming um, really to uh, the end of this section um, and we've been looking really at uh, the carnal ways of the last days uh, uh, as we're looking really at verses 1 to 9 and uh, say for a long time now we've been verses 1 to, to 4 and uh, hopefully well, really the plan is that sort of by the beginning of June uh, after uh, holidays and all uh, that I'll be finished uh, down to verse 9 and say there are 19 characteristics of the last days that we're looking at. We're well through the list. And we're going to look at another two this morning too that really I believe tie in so well with each other. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll see the connection and uh, see how it applies to us really um, in the, the, the present day. Uh, do remember the meeting this evening, as George has said, it was back holiday weekend. And we've seen many are away. Um, we have William Sayers and his daughter Lydia, who will be singing tonight. And uh, they're always a, a, a blessing to us. William says, some of you many a time, always a blessing. And uh, let's encourage him, for your attendance tonight, and encourage others uh, to come along. And uh, pray that the Lord will, will really bless us uh, this evening. But this morning, say, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, we'll read from, and we're going to read to uh, the end of. of This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors. That's where we left it then the last time that we were in the study a few weeks ago. And then these next two that we'll be looking at this morning, um, the King James renders the uh, uh, heavy um, and high-minded. And it says those two that we're going to be looking at are here this morning. Uh, I was going to show a picture that, a picture that all set up this morning, but I wonder have you ever seen um, those signs on the back of a lorry? or on the back of a van and it just simply asks the question how am I driving and then call 0800 or whatever it is I wonder to myself has anybody ever actually called the number and some signs they would have on it as well report of going too fast uh, report of driving too reckless etc and uh, I, I, I suspect that those signs are on the back of those lorries and sign our vans because really the company, they want their drivers to be driving somewhat carefully, um, that they're not driving recklessly, uh, that they're not, um, uh, uh, now, especially whenever they're maybe in the midst of a town or whatever, and uh, you know, lorry drivers and, and van drivers, um, usually they're always in a hurry, aren't they? They always want to get the deliveries done. Want to get home for the end of the day, and maybe sometimes maybe they're only given a certain amount of time uh, to to do their deliveries, and uh, they know that, uh, that that they're being monitored, they're being watched all the time. But yet they have this responsibility not to drive recklessly. Say, uh, and, and uh, I suppose as well the other reason that, that that's done is because we all know. Maybe we all can say we're all guilty, but whenever you put somebody behind a steering wheel, um, uh, uh, it, it, it can result in some of the most reckless behaviour that anybody has ever seen uh, from from uh, from people. And, and sometimes, whenever you see it, you wonder how the driver, not just lorries and vans, even cars, and you wonder how the driver ever passed their test. But I think of how something like this happens as well in other avenues of life. I think of sports pitches. Whenever I was in coaching for Christ, we were, we as coaches were somewhat hesitant playing what would be called friendly matches 
against church folks who we were working with for a summer camp. Normally, and it happened uh, uh, here last year, we didn't play a match, but um, there was either nine coaches came from coaching for Christ every day. But sometimes what would happen is at the end of the week, whenever we got to know church folks, somebody usually out of the church would say, what about a wee friendly match just to finish the week off? I have to say that unfortunately sometimes it was anything but friendly. We had to draw the line and say, sorry folks, but this match is not being played anymore. Um, because one of the things that we knew was that sometimes the male in particular, whenever they cross that white line, as we call it, onto the pitch, it just seemed to be that the devil took over. Because their behavior, their attitude, and uh, like I, I, I have seen, uh, so one of our coaches was Stephen, who was here last week and injured, he got his uh, uh, he got a shoulder wrecked on, on a trip to Canada. There was this boy he arrived with his big farm language, and he thought, right, I'm going to sort these boys out. We were there to serve the Lord. That's the thanks we got. But anyway, Stephen was taken out, so he was. And we saw in other cases where boys, they just seemed to, uh, seemed to think it was the World Cup final that they were playing in. And there was so much at stake. One stamp. Once they crossed the line, their behaviour was reckless, it was uncalled for, and to be honest, it really was a disgrace. And how we're living in the day also, whenever we hear, we see it on the news, such things as riots. Uh, so often, whenever people go on the rampage, wrecking all around them, recently French people have been doing this in response to President Macron's change in policy concerning pensions. And Indeed, so bad was it that supposedly the visit of King Charles and the Queen Consort or Queen Camilla it had to be cancelled. And this is something as well that we see in America. Uh, people don't like maybe the president who's been elected, or maybe the Supreme Ruling or Supreme Court made a ruling on a particular uh, situation, and, and people don't like what is like the decision. What is it they do? They go on their rampage. Their behaviour is reckless. And we see it in sports fans as well. It doesn't just happen in the players. We know over the years there's been so much rioting by uh, like football fans and so forth. And then down through the years as well, is it not something that we've seen at times on our own streets here in Northern Ireland? Where people think, well, if we're going to get things uh, to happen to suit us, we need to go out and we need to behave in a reckless way. And using these few examples really here this morning in the introduction, the reality is I could have referred to many more examples. But isn't the world a crazy place at times when we see how people behave so often with such reckless behaviour? Whenever people, as we would say, blow their head gasket or blow the head gasket, say it's not very nice. Or whenever people go off on one, as we say, we prefer to be as far away as possible from them. You know, maybe we've had that and we thought, well, I'm getting out of here. Because if that's the way they're going to behave, well, I don't want to be around. Or when people get something into their head, it's very difficult to stop them, even when it causes harm and death to others. Cases there have been with a number of casualties has even run into millions, I think, of... Uh, I think of Hitler. And Vladimir Putin, or, uh, Vladimir Putin seems to be very much on a similar pathway, does he not, on the present day as well. But whenever we think of all this, and we say there's so many other things, large scale, small scale, that I can refer to this morning, but isn't it comforting this morning as well that for us as the children of God, such actions, they do not take God by surprise. Isn't it lovely that whenever we see tragedies happen in the world, or we see things seemingly getting out of hand, out of, uh, uh, out of scale, and, and there's lots of deaths? Say, so isn't it comforting to know that, that it doesn't take by God, God by surprise? God is not looking down on it and saying, Oh, where did that come from? How did that happen? Because what we know is that God, He knows all things, He knows the end from the beginning. And that's why the Word of God is saying, tomorrow's news today, and He's telling us here in these verses as we've, read, uh, as we've considered so much, as to what is going to be happening in these days before the Lord Jesus Christ returns again to receive His own unto Himself. And we know that it's not 
uh, it's not going to be easy times, particularly for those of us who are saved. But one of the things that God has written about, or two of them things, is what we're going to be looking at this morning, as he says here through Paul, uh, as Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that in the last days, that the, some of the perilous times, the perilous things that are going to be happening is what he calls here in the King James Version, that which is heavy, and that which is high-minded. Now what does all this mean? Because Really, the word heavy in particular is a word we don't use every day. Well, there are four things I want you to note with me this morning. I want you to consider, first of all, a, a recklessness in behavior. Now, what we can expect in these last days is a recklessness in behavior. See, this we see in the first of these two attributes, these two characteristics of the last days that we're looking at, where it says in the last days that people will be heady. Now, I think that's how you pronounce the word. It's spelled H-E-A-D-Y. I don't know what it's called. I think it's pronounced heady. I even put it in the dictionary that speaks to you. Because I wasn't sure it was heady or heady or whatever. And uh, I come from uh, our modern action. And if you change the first letter from an H to K, well, it's not Katie. Well, maybe someone pronounced it as Katie, but it's Katie. So it is. And, uh, but I think when you put an H in the English language, it is the word Heady. But what does it mean? Well, one of the ways to find out is obviously check across the translations of, of the Word of God. The NIV, if you have an NIV this morning, it has, it has the word rash. The people in the last days will be rash. That doesn't mean they will have a rash. It means they will act rashly. So they will. Well, the ESV and, and, and a couple other versions, the NLT and the New American Standard Bible, it, they use the word reckless. So the dictionary, the word rash is the word reckless. Um, there's a, a book as well that, that preachers use, and it's called the Strong's Concordance. And uh, what it does do is it, it gives you the word in English, and then tells you what the Greek word is for the New Testament and the Hebrew word for the Old Testament, and then it seeks to define it. And the Strong's Concordance defines the word heavy as this falling forward that is headlong, and then. Uh, following on, it says the, the word rashly. Uh, and, and I think we can get that picture in our mind. You somebody that's you know, the, 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 that is falling forward, that is head on. There's no stopping them. That they're on a path to destruction. And, and, and I think another word which we can use, and one which some of maybe the, the, the not so familiar Bible translations uh, in the present day is the word headstrong. Wonder if you ever said that to somebody, oh, they're headstrong. I, there's just no talking to them. You can let me get them to change their mind simply because they are headstrong. And the understanding is that in the last days we can expect people that will go down the pathway of reckless behavior. The reality is that there is little chance of anyone stopping them. Perhaps, say, perhaps we've all met somebody like this in life. Somebody who's got something under their head. And there's little or no stopping them, and uh, we worry about them because we are afraid of the destruction that they may cause as a result of their actions. By all accounts, it explains the reckless behaviour behind the shooting of six people in a Christian school a number of weeks ago in America. Three children, three adults were all shot whenever a pupil went in there, or a former pupil, I think it was, went in, and had only one thing on their mind. Or maybe you remember the case of Anders Breivik, known primarily for committing the 2011 Norway attacks uh, on the 22nd of July. We know that he killed eight people by detonating a van bomb in Oslo, and then he killed 69 uh, uh, participants of a workers' youth league summer camp. Whenever he went out, he was to an island, a place called Utoya, and there he just uh, shot all around them. Or maybe more so, uh, more common to us, we never forget, uh, because of the scale of it, is that, you remember the 9-11 attacks, way back in, in 2001. But it doesn't mean incidents on such a large and horrendous scale. Because it can be things that are even on a much smaller scale. And maybe this is we're seeing something more and more of. As we see the change in the attitude in society in, in, in recent years. 
You see, it could even be somebody that maybe uh, with a, a business idea that, that everybody knows would never work and it would result in bankruptcy, but there's just no talking to them. Or a spur of the moment thing in response to what has happened where a, maybe a person has attacked somebody else in a violent way or given them a berating that was just so uncharacteristic of you. No wonder if you ever experienced that. Where somebody has taken into you, maybe, maybe it was somebody at work, and, 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 you, and you thought to yourself, where did that come from? Yeah, because it just seems so uncharacteristic of them. Or we're living as well in the days, aren't we seeing, we're seeing terrible effects of alcohol and drugs. People think they're okay. Think they're okay to get behind the steering wheel of a vehicle, even whenever they're drunk, but they're far from being okay. And we, we, sadly, we hear so much of that. Uh, and, and we see what the police force do to try and, 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 and reduce the number of people who, who, who drink and drive and things like that. And yet every year, it seems to me, the situation's getting worse and worse. So what Paul talks about here, in, in the first of these two, is that people would be, they will be, they will be reckless, they, they will be heavy, they'll be, they'll be rash, and, and, and I think we're seeing so much of that all around us. Then what I want you to consider with me, secondly, is, is a reason for this behaviour. We have we've looked at, first of all, you know, the, 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 the recklessness in behaviour, but secondly, a, a reason. Can I say that, that as we look then at the next word, which is high-minded, that it's not the only reason for people behaving in such a reckless way. But I believe that the next uh, word that we have here, high-minded, is closely connected to it and is a reason as to why sometimes people behave in such a reckless way. What does the word high-minded mean here in 2 Timothy 3 and 4? Well, again, the other versions, what do they use? And I mean, use the words, it uses the word conceited. ESV says swollen with conceit. The New Living Translation says be puffed up with pride. And I'm sure by now you're starting to get that picture in your mind of what this person is. So putting it in today's layman terms, it's, I think it's somebody who, you know, who, who thinks they're better than everybody else. They, they, they are somebody who think that maybe they're a cut above everybody else. Maybe the word that we would use sometimes is snow. They, they, they like to act like a snow. There's somebody who has little or no time for those who maybe don't fit into their, league, their, 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 their social category of society. Usually they're what we would call, don't we, uh, that they're a know-it-all. Um, but perhaps we would say, well, they think they know it all, don't they? That their thinking is, is, is only right. Um, and aren't we living in a day when when there, there's so little toleration of other people's views, isn't there? That people are now living today, and in today's world, where they think, well, I have this view, and I'm better than everybody else, and my view is the only view that's right, and if you have a different view, well, they, 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 they almost hate the, the, the people with the other view. See, there, there, there's little or no toleration across society. Their mindset in life is always to be seen, to be bigger, to be better, to be greater than everybody else. And sadly, it's discouraged, I think, as well in, 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 in evangelical churches. People they get this idea that, well, look at my social standing, look at my job. Look, look at my possessions, uh, uh, look at my qualifications, oh, I'm better than everybody else. And, 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 and they're they expecting people to uh, almost to bow to them and, and, and that they have the better so to say and, and, and even in the local church. To say, is it not something that we see is happening? So as people often ask the question, why are there so many denominations? Well, I think, in a nutshell, the answer is there's so many fallouts. So many fallouts because people get this idea that they are right and they're the only one right. We can have different ideas. We don't change the gospel. The gospel must not change in any way at all. And, and, and if 
the gospel isn't being watered down well. Sometimes maybe there has to be a, a, a parting of the way to remain firm to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're living in a day when, when the word of the people within churches, they want to water it down. They want to, to drop so much of the gospel. They don't want us to offend people in our preaching. Well, like the preaching of the gospel is always going to affect. Sometimes say maybe we do have to part ways. But yet at times there's so many other things that we will that fall out of others simply because of maybe something like social status. That's not what the Church of Jesus Christ is today. To say it's talking about here that in the last days there's, there's going to be these perilous times. People who are high-minded, people who are full of themselves. But yet I think of the words of John the Baptist, he must increase. I must decrease. We'll come to more of that in a moment or two, but to say as we look at this, we see a recklessness in behavior, we see a, re a reason, it's not the only reason, there are other reasons, but sometimes people, uh, they say they, they, they lose their head and they in a reckless way, but so often it, it can be because people think Oh, I'm so much better than you or everybody else. But then I want you to notice thirdly with me, and this takes us to the book of Esther, so we'll have the, the screen that I've set up for it all, but you'll not be able to, to, to see it here this morning, but I, I want you to consider thirdly with me a representation of this behavior. See, the thing is, the great thing is, when you look at these words, you always can very, very quickly find a, a, a great illustration in the Word of God. And a great illustration towards this is a man in the, in the book of Esther called Haman. And uh, Haman uh, was somebody who certainly was full of conceit, full of pride. Somebody who thought, oh, well, I'm better than everybody else. And, 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 and if you turn to the book of Esther, we'll be turning in a moment to uh, Esther chapter 5. And you can turn to that and say, this man, Haman, we read of him, say, in this book, really he thought he was... The bees knees, as we say. King Ahasuerus was the king of Persia and Media at the time. And what King Ahasuerus did was he promoted this man, Haman, to be an important official in his court, as, as really he was set above all the princes of the court. And you'll see that in Haman, or Esther chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, all was great for, for him until, uh, until Haman realized. That there was one man in the kingdom who wouldn't bow to him, and that was Queen Esther's uncle, a man called Mordecai. And you see, him and he loved to go about. I, I, I picture him you like as, as you like the Pharisees that we read of in the New Testament, where they had their, their robes and all, and as they walked down the street, and, and particularly the chief of the Pharisees expected everybody just to clear the pathway for them. And everybody to reverence them, to, to bow to them, and all those sort of things. And, and that's a picture I get in my mind of this man, Haman, after he had been promoted by King Ahasuerus, that whenever he went through the streets, that because of, he, of his great position, he expected people to, to bow to him, to clear the pathway for him. But then he discovered one day that as he was doing this, there was one man who wouldn't do it, and that was the man called Mordecai. This infuriated him, him and so much that actually what he did as a result of it was he set out to kill not just Mordecai, but to kill all the Jews of that day, especially as Mordecai was a Jew. And, and, and sometimes it's been said of, of, of this man, Haman, that he was the first Hitler to live in the world because he was the first one to try and wipe out all of the Jews. And through cleverness, Haman had a decree passed by the king. The king of Hazurus that all the Jews throughout the kingdom be killed as he convinced the king, uh, convinced the king that the Jews, they were not obeying the law of, 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 of the kingdom of, of, of Persia at that time, Persia and Media. And what, he, what Haman didn't know was that, was that remember how uh, the king had been hurt? 
Remember how his uh, first wife she wouldn't bow to him and then she uh, was disposed of and, and then King Ahasuerus, he got a new wife and that was of course Queen Esther. But what nobody knew, and I think the king didn't know, and certainly Haman didn't know, was that Queen Esther was a Jew herself. So we can see how the picture is, you know, it, it all comes together and how it un 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 unravels, that here's a man who is anti-Semitic, he hates the Jews, and, and he's got this law passed to wipe out the Jews, but he didn't know that the king's wife was a Jew herself. Secretly, Mordecai, whenever he got word of all this, he got word to Queen Esther, what her husband king had signed a, 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 an agreement for. Thankfully, she built up the courage to approach the king, because you see, even though she was his wife, uh, she had to get permission to approach the king. She, she got the permission to do this, and um, uh, she, where she then was allowed to invite uh, the king and Haman to a banquet uh, that she had prepared just for the two of them. Whenever they both came and the king asked her what she wanted, up to half of the kingdom, she requested that actually both of them come again for another banquet the very next day. And, and, and on hearing this, this um, really thrilled him. And if you're, if you're in there in, in, in the book of Esther, chapter 5, go to verse 9 and we see then how the events unfolded and, and how we see uh, Haman and, and how he was a man who was high-minded uh, but then how he was going to lead to reckless behaviour. Verse 9, Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends, and Zeresh his wife. And Haman told them, listen to all of this, of the glory of his riches, and the multitude of his children, and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced, advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. You sense his pride, don't you? How he was full of pride here. How he was high-minded. But yet what we see in the next two verses is how he was still determined, or he was determined to be reckless. Look at verse 12. Haman said, moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared, but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet, listen to these words, Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. <coughs> he was infuriated. What happened was his wife suggested that the gallows be to execute Mordecai. But cutting a long story short, everything backfired for him. When Esther revealed to the king the next day, whenever they, uh, Haman and, and, and the king were with her, Esther revealed to the king that the plan of Haman was to destroy every Jew across the kingdom. So infuriated was the king. Esther declared that she was a Jew herself, and so infuriated was the, was the king that he had Haman executed on the very gallows that he had made for Mordecai. Mordecai then was promoted, and the Jews were seized as a result of Esther's courage. See, all this, I think, it serves to us not, is it not this morning as a warning. A warning that whenever we become full of ourselves, well, actually, so, so often what happens is that we are the one who suffers the most. And that really brings us on to our final point this morning, really as I seek to bring this all together, which is a response to this behaviour. We've looked at a recklessness uh, in behaviour, the reason or a reason for this behaviour, representation. Say, Haman is the classic example. Then we need to consider, well, a response. What is our response to this 
uh, this morning to all of this behavior. If we see this going on, maybe this is something you're experiencing in today's life. That around you you see somebody who's been reckless even towards you. Somebody who thinks that they are superior to you. Maybe something you experience in the workplace day by day. That you have somebody and they're just seeming away. They just think that they're just down on you all the time. They don't see you as being on their need. And, and therefore they're, they're making life miserable for you. When the classic text of the Asian to this, to our response in all of the children is Proverbs 16 and verse 18. There's quite a uh, few texts I have here. You're writing them down. I'm trying to slow them up so you can jot them down. I did have them on the screen, but obviously say we weren't able to get it. But what is it? Proverbs 16 and verse 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and the haughty spirit before a fall. The thing that I notice in Scripture is that not once in Scripture is the proud heart applauded. Not once in Scripture have I ever seen that through the proud heart, that heavy heart, that, uh, that reckless heart which comes from being high-minded, from thinking that we're better than any, everybody else and we we're more entitled to, to, to everything in comparison to everybody else. Not once in Scripture is the proud heart Applauded. In fact, pride in any reckless actions that leads to is condemned time and time again by God. What are some of the references? Well, Isaiah 3, verses 16 and 17, speaking of a situation in that day, moreover the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tingling with their feet, therefore the Lord will smite. With a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Say, nothing's hidden from God. He sees that proud heart. Zephaniah 3, towards the end of the Old Testament, verse 11, the Lord said, In that day shalt thou not be shamed for all, uh, shalt thou not be shamed for all thy goods, wherein thou hast transgressed against me. For so then I will take out uh, of the midst of thee them that rejoice in their pride, or in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. Say the Lord doesn't look nicely upon a proud heart. Proverbs 21 and verse 4 and the high look at a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. 1 John 2 and verse 16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. You know, Scripture clearly says about it all. So, instead, what is the key to conquering this? As we see it around us, as we're tempted by it, because that's the other reality every day, isn't it? If we're tempted with regards to pride, we want to be better than everybody else. We want others to think we're better than them. We do what we can to try and put ourselves on a pedestal. But yet, what is it Scripture tells us? Well, I think Micah 6 and verse 8 is the answer to it all. Taste should be your man. What is required of thee? What is good? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. <coughs> Again, I come back to that great subject of humility. Walking humbly before the Lord, recognizing that it is God that is over all things. It is God who has created all things. It is God who has created us in the way that we are. It is God who gives us all the blessings that we ever receive. But I know that sometimes there's that response with us for saying, well, I worked for this. And yes, we ought to have a good work ethic. Have a right work ethic. It is, it is biblical to work and to, uh, to, say, to, to earn a wage. But yet we need to remember that, that the, the gifting that we have to do that work, to be successful in, in business or in our job or whatever, it comes from God and from God alone. And so whenever we receive the blessings that we come back and we say thank you, Lord. 
Thank you that you've been so good to me. Thank you that you've enabled me through my exams. Thank you that you've enabled me to get that promotion and work. Thank you that you've enabled me to be able to do my job day by day. And living each day with a total dependence upon God to take us forward into the next day. And into the next day after that and into the future. It's, it's, it's in the book of Acts that Paul talks about this in him that we live and we move and we have our being. All things are of God. And it's so important then that as we live a life that we're not living as a people who are high minded, which then can lead to reckless behaviour. That we're people who are humble and we're totally dependent upon Him. And whenever we receive blessings from God, our response is very, very simple. We come at the end of it all, and after it all, we say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being so good to me. Thank you for providing. Thank you for keeping me safe. Thank you for giving me to do that thing. To do that which I've been able to do. And Lord, I'm trusting you for tomorrow and all of my tomorrows. May he be the one that increases in everything. And you decrease in terms of thinking that, oh, I'm better than everybody else. Oh, no, we're all here. Why? Because of the grace of God. Those of us who are saved, we're only saved because of the grace of God. It's not because we were ever better than anybody else. And there's absolutely no reason to think. Whenever we think of our sin, that he loved us, and gave himself for us, and died so that we could be saved, and yet there's millions upon this, upon this planet who still never even once heard the name of Jesus Christ. And today, maybe you're not saved, you know you're not saved, you realize how privileged you are today. If you hear the name of Jesus, if you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you hear that you need to be saved, and yet the reality is you're still rejected. And there's multitudes upon this earth that we have today. To hear of that name that is above every other name. And put their trust in him for salvation. Do not come today when you have this great privilege. To trust in God. Experience eternal life. And know that one day you're going to be in heaven. In eternity. May God bless and lead his word to our hearts today. We're going to sing our closing.
this morning we ask for your forgiveness of our people. The Lord at times think we don't need you. We think of how you're the great God. With you, Lord, all things are possible. In you, Lord, we live, we move, and we have our being. Lord God, we come to pray today that our, our dependence is upon you. The Lord, our lives are surrendered unto you. And Lord, that as we live our daily lives, that in all our ways we're acknowledging you. And know, our Father, that you're the one who directs our paths. Well, Father, we pray that we'll not be a high-minded people. Lord God, full of self, but Lord, that we're full of Christ. Full of the Holy Ghost. Lord God, our lives totally dependent upon you and that our lives bring glory and honour to your great and glorious name. Father, help us in our actions. Lord, we know that we sin each day. Forgive us, Lord. We do those things we ought not to be doing. We don't do those things we ought to be doing. Lord, help us. And Lord God, we're guided by you and live dependent upon you. So bless your word to all of our hearts. Bless those who will leave now. Uh, your hand be upon them for those of us who remain here for the Lord's table. May it be a blessed time as we remember him. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.